going to go to invite Sarah McMara, to the senior, okay. senior midwifery lecturer, to give the first talk. Our talk is the colonial approaches in research in teaching and research. It's going to be quite interesting because it's about midwif mid midwifery skills decolonized. Well done, Nicola and um, Sarah. Sorry. I think I might need these lights on an open day. Yeah. But remember, it's 10 minutes because you talk for a living, isn't it? Yeah, it, midwives, we do struggle to pull the rain into my I'm sorry if I run over. So, uh, thank you. It's nice to see you all this morning. So, yes, I'm Sarah McNamara. So, I'm one of the eight uh, midwifery lecturers in the team. As you know, I registered midwife for now and 14 years now. I think we've always strived to challenge inequalities in healthcare, now, obviously, in education as well. Black women in uh, the UK are more likely to die uh, during childbirth uh, than, their, than white women. Uh, previously, data uh, that came out over the pandemic said it was five times more. Uh, they do think apparently now we've done better, we've got to four times, but it's still four times more than it should be. Um, and I think what scares me most of all as a midwife with racial inequalities is actually the data also says that if a black woman is cared for by a, uh, a black midwife, her outcomes are improved even more which says we've got that level of institutional racism within our healthcare practice, within our society. But I'm in a position now privileged to have that supportive uh, undergraduate education, postgraduate education through, and it's our duty to challenge these inequalities and what is usually presented as quite a Eurocentric curriculum. Um, I, I guess I've avidly followed the rise in voices of midwives, service users, campaigners and women out there, and we're keen um, as academics not to you know to ensure that that potentially self-fulfilling prophecy of um, misuse and, uh, and abuse of statistics uh, regarding pregnant women um, that we challenge the data that is presented to us and we say why is this happening what can we do to make the change now you know five times more four times more it's still too many more uh, purely based on the basis uh, of often um, somebody's colour um, a colonial, a colonial curriculum is obviously an accurate curriculum um, and decolonising, I guess, learns us to um, prompt consideration of everything from a new perspective. So the SIM speculum uh, is something that we use in obstetric emergencies. It was created by what they uh, referred to as the founding father of gynaecology, uh, Dr. J. Marion Sims. He developed a pioneering tool and surgical techniques uh, specifically related to women's reproductive health and he earned his title through contributions but this was by experimenting on enslaved black women. So since his research was conducted on enslaved black women obviously without anaesthesia uh, he had to his um, multiple subjects he never struggled to get a subject which is just beyond frightening. Uh, critics say that he cared more about the actual experiments themselves and the therapeutic treatment. Um, he practiced medicine at a time when treating women was considered distasteful um, and he invented what we still use today the sims vaginal speculum and we use it as a form of uh, dilatation tool. Um, also, there is a uh, an obstetric position we use in emergencies. It's also called the SIMS position. That is still being taught today in undergraduate and postgraduate education. Um, obviously, you know, SIMS at the time believed that there was nothing wrong with the methods that he undertook. And what we've had to do as a, um, as a profession is start to think, why are we still using these names? Why is it appropriate that we still classify with that terminology? You know, his legacy continues not just through the use of instruments and procedures, but bias is still held by medical professionals as well. For example, there's some research undertaken in 2016 and it found that American medical students and the residents held false beliefs about biological differences between black and white women uh, and there's a racial bias evident there that they have this myth, this still misconception that black people don't feel pain which is just staggering and even in today's society there is still those beliefs out there so obviously you know there will always be the argument of sims contribution evolved reproductive health sciences but this is at the expense of women that had no voice and this is what we have to be able to teach the students is also the history behind things and why we need to look at uh, amendments and obviously teach the truth. 
Now, just moving on to one of the other skills we look at is um, the female pelvis. So for well over 50 years, students of midwifery, obstetrics, um, and health have been taught what we call the caldwell molloy classification um, of the female pelvis. And indeed, when I trained, we were taught that there was four basic pelvic shapes uh, and, and no one else would sit out of that remit. And actually what the data said to us, uh, you know, that you will just need this information to pass your tests to be able to know how to birth babies and support women during the episode of care. But what we now know is actually that there is mixed pelvis you know people might have a different rear pelvis to a four a four pelvis and it, we know no one person sits within those four categories but what comes out of the learning is that potential uh, potential racist uh, criticisms of those four classifications so when the classification became widely adopted it was standard teaching from the 1950s even to now um, and medical textbooks, midwifery textbooks, uh, they continue still in some additions to categorise these four pelvis. Uh, and what's the general association um, associated with the different type of pelvis is that obviously they would impact on mechanisms of labour and birth. And what they were saying is, if you had this pelvis, you didn't have the optimum shape to birth your baby. And they always class women uh, that were non-white in those pelvis that were saying you weren't optimum. You didn't have what we wanted. Uh, and I was, you know, 14 years ago, I was trained in that mode of, and it's only in the latter few years we are starting to see changes um, and look at the evidence that we now have. So when uh, Caldwell and uh, Molloy actually published their works in uh, the early 1930s in Nazi Germany, there was obviously an idea of the pure types of pelvis um, and, it, and it fit with the uh, German ideology Racism was embedded in the paper uh, that they actually presented where they actually talked about the uh, anthropoid pelvis, one of the four which is mostly attributed to non-white uh, people. They referred to it as that of the primitive races and not the optimum uh, mode for uh, birthing babies. So we need to almost, if you like, have the evidence, we need to teach the students what those four elements are, but then take it that one step. Further. So within that, I choose to almost teach and then unteach the pelvis. You know, as midwives, we feel lots of differences when we examine women and we care for women in birth. And, um, you know, sometimes we see what looks like a, a challenging pelvis birth a baby very, very effectively. Um, but these static four types of pelvis are still being taught in certain curricula UK wide. And I choose now to, as I say, teach and then unteach it because it's an opportunity. Um, to, if you like, see how medical information uh, presented as unbiased can be used to expose myths, uh, including the roots of racism at the base of it. And it can be used as a way of showing roots of an old story of that static pelvis as the passageway. Uh, midwifery is all about storytelling, so it fits uh, in the journey that we have with students. But obviously it's important that we talk to them about what do we do with this information now? How do we discuss the bones in the, in the pelvis in a way that can be used as an opportunity to reveal the myths of the roots of racism while using the various shapes and complexities of the pelvis so we can look at other solutions of episodes of care? So I have chosen not to get rid of the model when I am teaching because uh, it's a way we can weave those discussions in and have those open um, threads of conversation within a room as well. And often it's quite surprising to students when you think they've just come from an A&P lesson about the pelvis and we're going to have a whole discussion about racism at the same time. But it's about giving those uh, floor and discussion and, and midwifery students are quite vociferous as well, so they really do engage with us. And one of the other skills I've just looked at towards the end is the um, APGAR score. So this is, um, it's something that was formulated by Dr. V Virginia APGAR in the 1950s. And essentially it's when babies are born at, and, and at one minute, at five minutes and 10 minutes, we give them a score out of 10. And basically that score we work on, do we need to resuscitate that baby is essentially what it is. Uh, and it acts as like an index for looking at the condition of baby at birth. But it was written in the 1950s and what I've had to do, as you'll see on the, the next slide coming up, is I've made an amendment to it because actually it was based on white babies. But this was still 
still a school that even up until the last few years is still in textbooks, is still in publications, is still available. I think Google did one of the 50th celebrations and Virginia Apgar was on there as well uh, from when she'd uh, actually devised the school and it doesn't seem to have been picked upon. So this is the actual original score, as you can see here. I mean, you cannot possibly have a black baby at birth that is going to be pink. It's not possible, but yet the textbooks still tell us this. So what I've, I've done with it, and I've done with this with the students moving forward, is I've made an adaptation to it. So we talk more about circulation and perfusion and what is the norm for that baby. It was only last year that a medical student actually stood up and made a publication called Mind the Gap. Because actually what they've said is we need to look at different skin conditions, OK, in, in uh, relation to certain conditions to understand them. So this is the adaptation that I've put forward so the midwives can use this in their practice and they don't talk about more about how how does the baby look? OK, are they perfusing effectively? And just to close, I wanted to send you away with some thoughts. The slide here just shows you some of the learning resources uh, that have utilised publication uh, as additions. You know, what does your subject use? Have your books, have your topics changed over the time? Are we seeing more variation in the resources that we're using? Um, thank you for your time. That was very much a whistle-stop tour and I look forward to the rest of the day. Thank you.